So just a couple of acknowledgements before I get started. I want to thank Megagen, uh, Ben and Megagen Canada for, and also Megagen Global for inviting me to do this lecture. It's an honor of mine to uh, represent them as well as uh, a, a member of the Minec team. I also want to thank my, um, my mentor, Dr. Howard Gluckman. Uh, Howard is based out of South Africa in Cape Town, and he has his own academy called the Implant Aesthetic Academy. Uh, and I will be sharing some of his slides into, in this lecture today, as well as the kit that he designed with MegaGen. Um, just a reminder, I know that virtual, I don't know what the exact virtual etiquette for these lectures are now, but you guys are feel free to take photos and screenshots, but please don't video record uh, the lecture today. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit about myself. Um, ben kind of introduced me already, mostly about my um, educational background. So. On the left side, you can see that I went to uh, Western Ontario for uh, medical science and then followed that by the University of Pennsylvania for uh, dental school. And then I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor for a three-year perio program. After that, I went to work at a clinic in Boston called Perico. It's uh, one of the oldest perio clinics in the world, founded by two of the perio greats, Dr. Nenz and Dr. Kramer. Uh, and I spent two years there before finally moving home to Canada, where I'm from. Um, so currently I'm working at two main clinics, uh, as well as traveling around the GTA a little bit. Uh, so I spend most of my time at Peterborough Periodontics, um, a practice that used to be owned by Dr. Craig Allison and now it's, uh, myself. And then also started up a new clinic last year called Smile Studio Dental up in Thornhill. Um, on the right side, you can see uh, kind of the educational component that I'm involved with uh, kind of goes along with the quote at the bottom by Albert Einstein. I truly believe that education or wisdom is not really just about schooling, but it's that lifelong attempt to try to acquire it. So I'm part of Bites Institute, I'm part of ACE Dental Institute, as well as I did a little bit of teaching at Harvard. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm also part of the MINEC team, which is the research and um, presentation team for Megagen. Okay, so in terms of today's learning objectives, um, just want to try to keep things pretty simple. I don't want to bore everyone with too much uh, background information. We'll really dive into some cases after we cover some, some background, but we need to understand some of the challenges that face us in aesthetic dentistry, especially as, a, uh, as it pertains to anterior teeth. Then we want to talk about some current treatment modalities, so there are a few other than socket shield. But then we want to look at why those um, have their shortcomings and why we need to do uh, socket shield more and more. Uh, then we'll talk about the rationale and the protocol for partial extraction. There's a whole umbrella of different types of treatments that fall under that, uh, as well as highlight some of the features of these two kits that Megagen offers. They're very similar, but they're also different. And uh, I think that uh, you'll be able to see which one might work better for you. As I mentioned, we'll uh, have some clinical case presentations with also kind of a step-by-step -step protocol to show you how this case or how this procedure is really done. So anytime we talk about uh, dentistry or implants or surgery or anything, we really have to look at risk assessment. Risk assessment is super important even before we pick up the scalpel or pick up the handpiece to do anything inside the patient's mouth. Um, this comes in all shapes and forms, so I'm just going to highlight a few of them here, but it's like systemic conditions, the smile line, history, the age, the patient expectations, all of these are very, very important. Um, there's many more than what's on the screen right now. You guys know, you know just as well as myself how important it is to take all of these into account before we come up with a diagnosis for the patient and then a treatment plan. So in today's lecture, I think what we'll try to focus on is three kind of main keys. And these three keys are important in all sorts of perio surgery, uh, in dentistry, um, but especially in anterior aesthetic implants. And those three are these uh, kind of mantras that we live by. So the first one is bone sets the tone. Um, and these are made fun to, to rhyme a little bit if you haven't heard them before. Bone sets the tone is very true because without the bone underneath, it's very hard to get aesthetic results. Um, you can make up for it in certain ways, but it's, it's very difficult. So that's the first one. The second one is that even though bone sets the tone, the real issue that we have ends up being the tissue, right? So when something doesn't look good, when something is not aesthetic, it's not that, you know, bone is sticking out somewhere, it's that the gums have receded or the gums are thin or they're showing the gray hue of the implant. So that's also very important. And then what's really kind of uh, very pertinent to us, especially in the maxillary anterior, which is the area we're going to focus on today, is that the buccal, fate, the buccal plate sets the fate. 
Um, and again, that's really important. We'll talk about, uh, we'll show you some studies as to why it's important and why uh, it's so easy to lose that. Okay, so a couple of studies, I promise there won't be too many. The studies will just really highlight why this is a problem. Okay, so the first study here is a very famous study. It's um, by, it's a systemic review by, systematic review, sorry, by van der Weyden. Um, this kind of follows up on some of the older studies that were done on dogs, and then the first study done on humans was by Schott in 2003. But this study kind of just highlights a couple of things that the average bone loss after an extraction in width is about 3.87 millimeters, and the average loss in height is about 1.67 millimeters. So definitely losing more in width than in height, but still pretty substantial for both, okay? Another really classic study here is by uh, the Boozer group. Dan Boozer does a lot of studies related to bone, to implants, and kind of timing of implants. Um, so this is looking at the dimensional bone and, bone and soft tissue changes after an extraction uh, in aesthetic sites. So as you can see on the right, we have some CBCT images. I don't know if highlighter is working. CBCT images and then also a morphometric kind of volume, volumetric um, superimposition to show what the changes are. So what they concluded was that uh, the thin buccal bone, so if it starts off being thin before you get the tooth out, it will lead to substantial resorption at about the eight week time. Um, and if that buccal bone is greater than a millimeter to begin with, then you only lose about 1.1. But if it's less than a millimeter when you begin with, you lose seven and a half millimeters of bone on average. So that's very substantial. You can see on the pictures. Um, the thin and thick type, how dramatically different they are at eight weeks. Okay, so kind of piggybacking on that study and how and to link that and make it more pertinent. So you're saying, you know, one millimeter or more, you're okay, you don't lose that much, but how often do we have more than one millimeter? And so this study um, by the Lindy group is, is demonstrating that. So they basically took CBCTs and measured at one millimeter, three millimeters and five millimeters below the CJ or below the crest. And uh, they basically made some averages and their conclusions were that for the maxillary anterior, so from the one three to the two three, uh, at about 85% of those sites are less than a millimeter. So we're into that category where we lose 7.5 if we just take the tooth out. And then furthermore, in 50% of sites, actually it's even less. So it's less than half a millimeter. So, you know, it's even likely that you will break off that buccal plate when the tooth is extracted. Okay, so this is really important to keep in mind um, that, you know, we, we know the problem that we face is most likely gonna be on the thin side, right? So it, let's say 15% is more than one millimeters. You're still at risk. You still have to be really careful and, and figure out how to deal with that long-term. Okay, and then this other study by the same group, uh, Danny Boozer's group, uh, they wanted to just highlight some of the objectives uh, when it comes to anterior aesthetic implants. So they asked things like, when should we do this? Uh, should we do grafting at the time of, should we do a soft tissue graft? So kind of a review paper as well, but the primary objective that they stated for um, an aesthetic implant in the anterior is that you want to have optimal long-term aesthetic treatment outcome with high predictability, and low risk of complications for both hard and soft tissues. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but it basically summarizes that kind of everything is important to try to get us that long-term stability. So that's primary objective. Secondary objective um, for implants in the aesthetic zone are things like uh, the less number of surgeries would be better. You know, you try to reduce having to open the flap. As we know, we lose bone and tissue when we open a flap. Uh, you wanna have a little pain and morbidity for the patient, obviously shortest overall treatment time so that you know patients don't have to deal with things like a flipper or even a temporary and also most cost effective so if you can reduce number of visits that might mean it's more cost effective so important to keep these kind of parameters in mind as we go through the lecture today okay so some critical factors so this is what i'm going to focus the rest of the the um lecture on today is immediate implants okay so we're taking a tooth out in the anterior either the whole tooth or part of the tooth and we're placing an implant immediately so i know there's other modalities where we take a tooth out and wait just for the soft tissue to heal uh, or we take the tooth out and put the bone graft and, and let that heal but we're just going to focus on immediate uh, anterior implants today 
So some of the critical factors is again, it's not an exhaust list. It's just uh, kind of, I think what's, what's very, very important in terms of achieving success. So without you know, needing to say much, we want to perform as minimally invasive an extraction as possible. Because if we break that buckle plate, it didn't matter if it was more than a millimeter to begin with, we're not going to have it anymore. Okay, the second part is a 3D positioning of implants. So generally, and I think this is a trend that has been kind of uh, trending more and more towards the palate. So smaller implants towards the palate, further away from the buccal plate means that you have more of a gap to put bone into and that will protect that implant over time. Okay, so I think uh, if you look back 15, 20 years ago when people did anterior implants, they would pick the largest implant possible and put it right into the socket. And that would often cause a lot of recession and problems for the future. So I think that paradigm has already shifted and people are pretty much only doing narrower implants uh, at, in the front. The implant diameter. So I just kind of mentioned on that, um, you know, implant diameter is important. You want to have an implant diameter that is um, large enough that you're going to have the right type of stability. You're not going to have fractures, um, but you don't want to have it so large that it's going to impinge on that towards that buckle plate. So that's really important where it comes to working with the right implant company and knowing the types of implants you're using. Um, there's thousands of implant companies in the world, and there's a reason why the same, you know, big, big names come up over a number. The last one is the jump gap. So the jump gap is the distance between the implant and that buckle plate. So as I mentioned, the further parallel you can place that implant, the uh, more of a jump gap you will have, and then there, there will form more buckle bone uh, once it's healed. Okay, so we've covered some of the some of the problem, like why this is a problem, why we have uh, an issue after extractions of the anterior teeth, and why it's a concern. So now we're, we're shifting our gear towards uh, some of the modalities before we talk about socket shield. So there's three kind of uh, pretty popular, I guess, uh, modalities. The first one, orthodontic extrusion. I'm not really going to touch upon. It's not a surgical intervention. It's it's just a way of uh, bringing the teeth down so that you the you bring it down slowly so that the bone comes with it. And you're essentially doing like a vertical bone graft uh, by pulling the teeth down. And then once it's at the level you like, you take tooth out and you can do kind of an immediate implant. Okay. But the dual focus on a showcase on for each of them is dual zone grafting uh, by Dr. Stephen Chu. And then the surgical veneer graft, which was described by uh, Agni in 2017. So dual zone grafting, um, again, Dr. Stephen Chu, 2012. He basically looked at uh, the area around the neck of the implant where the interface is. And he um, kind of identified two different zones and he named them quite famously now, the tissue zone, which is obviously where the tissue resides above the head of the implant and then the bone zone. So the, the, where this name comes from, dual zone grafting is that you don't actually just want to graft the bone area, but you actually want to graft also into the tissue area because that bone graft material as it kind of uh, heals is going to help support that uh, soft tissue and create that thickness that you want. So I'll show you a case of mine. This was a 63 year old male with a hopeless uh, central incisor 1-1. Uh, this is the CBCT plan of the implant. So here um, I decided not to do socket shield as was uh, because the tooth was already very loose and that's we'll touch upon it in the later in the lecture, but that's one of the contraindications. Also just the, the narrowness of this space was, uh, was hard to fit an implant that wasn't gonna touch the shield. Okay, so this is how he presented. You can kind of see on the radiograph here that uh, there is a large lesion, uh, looks like a perforation from that end post. He has an implant next door, which makes things more challenging right away. You can see a tiny speck of bone in between the implant and the tooth. Hopefully that will stay there. So this is after extraction, the whole tooth was extracted. Um, this is a placement of an implant. And so what I've done here, this is the most important picture of this case is that there's bone graft that's filled basically through the whole area up to the, the gingival margin, right? So some of it might get pushed out as you're putting either a temporary or a healing uh, abutment on, but you want to have it pretty much squeezed in there. And another aspect of this procedure or of this technique that Dr. Chu describes is that you should ideally have a provisional that seals the area and also applies a little bit of pressure to push that bone into the gum area. 
So the way we do this is we have a healing abutment that's placed there. So this is about three millimeters tall and three to four millimeters. And you can see it's uh, kind of parallel position. So that's the jump gap and also dual zone grafting has been done. And what I was able to do was use the patient's own tooth or the crown that he had and convert it into a uh, chair side temporary. And so that gets inserted. This what you see here is just a little piece of PRF membrane just to help the tissues heal a bit. Uh, if I'm being critical, probably a little bit too much pressure here, you can see a little bit of blending of the tissue. Okay, and that's the immediate post-op radiograph. So this is at six weeks. Uh, what you can notice here is, yes, we did get a little bit of marginal discrepancy, probably due to uh, pushing the area a little bit too hard. I should have relieved the temporary a little bit more to, to create more space for that dual zone graft to take. Um, but overall, I would say very peeling. Um, you can see the tissue tone is good. And at least for now, the margin uh, seems pretty stable or the thickness of the tissue seems pretty stable. Okay, so that's dual zone grafting. We'll talk about uh, the next type now, which is the surgical veneer graft. Um, it wasn't described by Yuli Grunder, but this paper is really um, important because it tells us about uh, volume volume of tissue after uh, grafting or not grafting for these sites. So the results show that the average loss of volume in non-grafted group, you lose about 1.06, one, one millimeter of tissue volume. So we're talking tissue now. Whereas in a grafted group with a connective tissue graft, you can actually get a slight gain of 0.34. So the difference there is about almost one and a half millimeters. And that's pretty significant for tissue, especially if you're talking about longevity, because we know uh, as we age, the tissue thins out. So the more you have you know, to start with, the better. So then uh, I always ask this question sometimes to uh, my, my, team at, my team at work and or just in conversation with other dentists, but if you had to choose for an anterior implant yourself, if you would have rather had thick tissue, but a thin bone or thin tissue, but thick bone, which one would you choose and why? And um, this is probably the worst part of lecturing online because I can't ask you guys questions because no one can really answer me. Um, but spoiler alert, I would say, there's no right answer, but I would say thick tissue with thin bone is a better. I mean, obviously you want thick for both, but that would be better because the tissue, if it's thick and healthy, it can actually protect that area and seal it quite nicely and have a better long-term result. Okay, so let me show you a case of mine of surgical veneer grafting. Um, this was described by Agnini in 2017. This is a, a much younger male, 31 years old. He actually had a completely fractured 1-1. One -one, so you'll see that in the CBCT slices here. So you can see it's fully broken off. You don't know why he wasn't having much pain, but we, I think we see this once in a while in our practices. Um, and you can see the large radiolucency or at least a large PDL space around the root. So that suggests that the root is already mobile. So unfortunately, we were not able to do a uh, socket shield here. If you also look closely, you probably can see or estimate that there is going to be a fenestration or at least some kind of dehiscence or fenestration in the buccal bone once the tooth is out. Okay, so that's how he presents clinically. You can see the crown is a little bit longer than the two ones. It's the one one that's fractured. You can see the X right here, clean fracture, totally mobile, totally two separate pieces. A little bit of buccal swelling here too. So the tooth was taken out obviously in two separate pieces. I kept the crown to uh, make the provisional later. Uh, an implant is placed again to slightly towards the palate. Um, no socket shield here, so we don't have to worry about hitting the shield, but you still want to put it in kind of the, the most palatal position that you can restore comfortably. It also allows you to restore it um, with the screw retained rather than cement retained. So here's a CTG that's procured from the palate, and you can see that probably would have got a slightly longer piece mesodistally, but he had pretty thick biotype overall. Like if you look at his 2 1 here, there's already pretty thick tissue. I didn't really need to add too much, I just wanted to add. Um, a protective layer here because I knew that the buccal bone was gone and also the tissue was going to recede with it. So that's the implant placed with the tissue graft. The tissue graft then gets slid into the, you know, there's got a pouch there because you just took the tooth out and that just gets secured by two sutures here at the top. Simple, simple interrupted sutures. And then what I've done is cut up a membrane. So this is kind of the ice cream cone technique uh, by Dr. Tarnow. And, excuse me, 
So what we're going to do here is try to build that buckle wall that was lost because, um, <clears throat> hold on one second. Okay, so the buckle plate was gone because we could see that on the, the CBCT. <clears throat> and so my attempt here was to place a barrier membrane. So if you look at this layer, it's kind of like a sandwich. The outside is the attached tissue of his flap. Then underneath that is CTG that was added. And then underneath that is gonna be this collagen membrane that's resorbable. And then between the membrane and the implant, we place our bone graft material. So it's kind of like a four layer sandwich. So after that's done, we can make the provisional. So the provisional was made and uh, inserted. We used his old crown. I made it a little shorter for protection. Um, what I should have done here, and I'll see later, is that I should have trimmed this a bit more to give more space to the tissue. But that's how he leaves on the day of surgery. This is him at four months. Uh, you can see maybe a tiny bit of scar or just the resemblance of a graft there, but I think it's uh, it's adhered nicely and it's taken pretty well. And the margin seems pretty even. And then also very importantly from the occlusive view, you can see the thickness of the tissue there. Still quite thick. This is gonna be modeled over time. Four months is not that long, but a good start. Okay, so this is, um, I did have him back in to trim the provisional because I wanted to make it a bit uh, narrower and have a better emergence profile so that um, we could get a little bit better of an aesthetic result at the end. So this was a uh, removal. I wanted to take a picture to see how the socket looked. A little bit inflamed, but that's not a big problem. Um, there wasn't too much eating at that time. So what I did with the provisional, this is the one that I made on the day of, you can see it's quite bulky here. I got that convex shape right at that, uh, at that margin. Same with here, a little bit bulky. So what I did was just trim it down a little bit and try to make it a bit more of a concave. We call that the reverse S curve there. So that's important to have so that you have, you just give more room for the tissues to grow. If you push it too much, it's not gonna grow. So that was reinserted. Unfortunately, he has kind of disappeared. Um, maybe because the provisional feels good and looks good and he's happy with it, but he's definitely overdue for getting his final crown. Okay, so now that we've kind of covered some of the other modalities that exist, that not saying those modalities are bad. Clearly we still do them, we still need to do them because we cannot do socket shield for every single case. Um, but here's a couple of pictures from Dr. Gluckman. Like why should we even consider having or doing partial extractive therapy? So. You can see here uh, an implant that's been restored five years ago. And you can see no matter what happens, there's gonna be a little bit of tissue change. And this happens whether it's the, the anterior tooth or the posterior tooth, right? So we have this slight dip in the like a little concavity there. You can see the vertical dimension change in the recession. Okay, just thinness of the tissue overall. So uh, this, there's many other reasons, but this is probably the main reason is that how do we stop the bone remodeling at all? Is it even possible? So I think that's what was the goal of, uh, of this whole therapy and why people set out to, to look into it. Just another example, um, again, Dr. Gluckman's case here at three months, you can see it looks great, right? We have very, very good tissue. It's very thick. This is just done regular um, bone grafting, no uh, socket shield was done here. At six years, you can see that there's definitely going to be a difference. Okay, a little concavity. Sometimes it's not a problem, especially in the posterior, but in the anterior, we can see that this would be uh, an aesthetic issue at, at the very least. Okay, so I'll describe um, the history behind socket gel a little bit, and then we'll talk about the two kits, uh, and then we'll show some cases. So socket gel has many names. So if you hear me saying socket gel or root membrane or partial extraction, they're kind of all talking about the same concept. And so this concept is that it's based on a very old kind of concept that, you know, root submergence was done either on purpose or inadvertently probably since the start of dentistry, right? So um, I think what people end up finding was, oh, if you left the root tip behind either by accident or not, uh, that the bone would actually stay there and the tissues would actually be okay as long as it didn't get infected or get loose or kind of make its way out. So that, that's been around since the 80s. It's not, it wasn't really coined a term back then. So that's just a finding. Uh, the people that really introduced this concept, I mean, there's different camps that uh, have different viewpoints on this. Some people think that 
Um, the Germans, Dr. Herzler and Zerd came up with in 2010. They still don't have a paper to support that. Um, I think it was around that. And a lot of groups were looking into this therapy already. So it's, as I mentioned, lots of different names for it. It's part of this um, big umbrella group called uh, partial extraction therapy. So the concept is that we talked about what happens to bone, especially in the maxillary anterior where the bone is super thin, what happens to it after extraction? There is so much remodeling, there's so much resorption. So how do we stop that from happening? Why is that happening? So if you think about buccal bone, the buccal bone is usually very thin. And when th bone is thin, you don't have the multiple layers of bone. You don't have a cortical layer followed by a cancellus, followed by another cortical layer. When it's super thin, you pretty much only have cortical bone. And around the tooth, we know that that bone is called bundle bone. So bundle bone is very firm, it's very cortical and it's very thick, or not, but it's very um, dense. Uh, but the problem with the density is that it lacks blood supply. So you have hardness and density, but you lack blood supply because you don't have the space for the blood vessels. So what happens is this uh, dense bone, the bundle bone is actually innervated. The blood supply comes mainly from the PDL. So the PDL of the tooth has, as we know, a good blood supply. And that's really what's providing that supply to the bundle bone, especially on the facial, where there's nothing else beyond it except gum and chew. So periosteum on one side has a little bit of blood supply. And then underneath we have um, the PDL. So the idea is that we want to maintain this PDL and the blood supply and therefore that will maintain the bundle bone, which it supplies, and hopefully that will maintain the gum tissue and the shape and everything kind of there after. That's kind of the, the real idea behind partial extraction therapy is, can we take part of the tooth out and kind of trick the body into thinking that the tooth is actually still fully there. And if the body thinks that, or the body reacts that way, then logically maybe nothing remodels, nothing happens and things can stay stable. So that's kind of, the, the general idea of uh, partial extraction therapy. So as I mentioned, this is the Zur paper. Uh, they did a histology proof of principle paper here and wanted to show that um, having, having a piece of root there and an implant next to it did not seem to you know, affect osseointegration. Like we knew from you know, back in the 60s um, that uh, we discovered osseointegration of titanium but then we weren't sure that's gonna happen around the tooth root, around the dentin, uh, as it does around bone. So through the histology here, they can see that new bone forms. Okay, so there's new bone or new cementum that forms between the shield and the implant. So this is kind of their, their first proof of principle paper about this technique. Since so many groups have looked into this, um, there's a big group from Greece that have looked into this and they have some outstanding follow-up studies as well. Um, the ones I'll focus on are, as I mentioned, my mentor, Dr. Gluckman, he's, done, uh, he's probably one of the leaders in the world with partial extraction therapy. There's a reason why he has a kit named after himself. Um, and he works with you know, people from all over, but mainly Dr. Salama quite, quite heavily from uh, uh, Team Atlanta. So this is a prospective stu or retrospective study, sorry, about um, evaluating 128 socket shield cases. And they wanted to look at both front and back and see kind of you know, what the follow-up is like. So in conclusion, they demonstrated that uh, this technique compared to some of the other techniques in terms of survival um, for both conventional and also delayed implant healing or implant placement, it, uh, it actually performed pretty competitively and pretty favorably. So at least out of that many number of cases, it wasn't like this case is, or this technique is quite a fluke. So Dr. Gluckman has uh, more recently, this is published in 2016, 2017, a couple of um, papers in the IJPRD. And this is basically describing the procedure of partial extraction therapy for the different modalities, as well as the different indications as you see on the screen, um, as well as some contraindications. Okay, so general indications is that you have a broken tooth or a tooth that needs to be extracted. Um, you want to try to preserve the alveolar ridge and uh, you can either do that for a pontic or you can do it for uh, an implant. And generally you wanna to try to be placing the implant at the same time, although you can do uh, with a delayed socket shield as well. Okay, there's other indications. This is a great paper, both this one and the part two, which I'll talk about. Um, I encourage you guys to give a read if you want a kind of a general overview of PET. So there are some contraindications as noted in this study, but also just as widely accepted. Um, the pretty 
self-explanatory. Uh, the first one is active periodontitis. If you have active periodontitis and the tooth is loose or the tooth has, um, you know, there's no stability in it, then obviously you cannot be using it as a shield because it's not going to be stable. Um, so that kind of goes in hand with the second part is the mobility of the root. So even if the tooth didn't have much mobility, but during the extraction of the partial extraction process became very mobile, then that's definitely an indication or a contraindication for continuing with the uh, partial extraction therapy. Uh, the last one I put asterisk next to because it's not fully agreed upon by everyone, but some people believe external resorption uh, should be a contraindication, but maybe it's a relative contraindication, we call it that. Um, definitely something just to keep an eye on. We know external resorption is just kind of a tough thing to deal with in general. Okay, part two of the paper talks about the actual procedure, which I'll get to a little bit later on. But I wanted to highlight that, of course, with anything, there's good and there's bad. There's definitely some complications that can arise from doing partial extraction therapy. Um, so the main ones are exposure of the shield. Okay, so depending on how you prepare the shield, depending on the angle, depending on just the body sealing, sometimes we know that you know these tips get pushed out if we accidentally leave them. So the shield can have an exposure that's either internal. So if you take the crown off, for example, you can see some internal exposure within the gums or it can be external like the one pictured. For both of them, treatment really is to uh, reduce the shield as long as it's not mobile or infected, reduce it until you can actually either graft or let the tissues, suture the tissues back together so that they can heal up. So like in this case, it was just sutured back together and the canine heals up. Um, and then there's obviously other things that can happen such as infection, so infection of the uh, the shield itself. This shouldn't happen if you are doing the procedure correctly. Uh, you shouldn't be leaving any of uh, like vital tooth structure, like a nerve behind. And then finally, failure of the shield. If it becomes loose, if it uh, actually fails, it can, it can cause the implant to fail. So there definitely is a risk there. Uh, I would say these are pretty minor, well, not minor, these are complications that don't happen all that often, at least according to the literature. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about two kits that Megagen has. The one on the left is called the root membrane technique, um, and that was, that's was that been around for a little while now, so that's the one that I've used for all of my cases. I recently just uh, ordered and got the PT kit, so I'm going to be using that uh, on some cases later on, but I will show that kit and how you use it and also some of Dr. Gluckman's studies. That's his kit um, towards the end of the lecture. So I have a video here. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be quite laggy. If it is, we can kind of skip it. Maybe if Ben, you can tell me if it's laggy. I'm just going to play it. This is basically a little video about how this uh, kid works. Sorry if that was really loud. Okay, so when you start off, you kind of generally have a broken tooth. You want to find the canal with the, either a gate split in or, you know, something similar. After that's been done, you've established your depth. You can start with what's called the initial shaper one to make a cut uh, mesial distance. After that's done, you're going to extend the full length with a longer burr, the initial shaper two, and you're going to finish that cut to basically separate the palatal and the buccal roots. You're going to very gently remove the palatal roots and then start shaping your shield. So there's a whole series of round burrs, round diamond burrs with different lengths. Um, so you can use them depending on uh, what, you know, what you're looking for. Uh, you can use a larger one here, as you can see, to reduce the top part, being very, very careful not to nip the, the facial tissue there. That's where this burr comes in, the final shaper one. This one is an ending burr with a bit of a, um, a track in the middle to help you guide, and that's going to cut uh, without cutting the gum tissue next to it. And then the final shaper two just creates a little bit of bevel at the shield so that um, it has a bit more restorative space. The rest of this video just highlights kind of the implant uh, drilling and placement protocol. So we can skip this. So once you're done with uh, all the drilling, there is a tapered diamond burr to basically just give you a little bit of tape on the powder wall because the powder wall sometimes can be very firm and will push your implant toward the buckle. Once your implant osteotomy is finished, you want to place your implant. Very, very important is you don't want the implant to be touching the shield anywhere. Okay, and then afterwards, uh, 
I generally place a bone graft in between the implant and the shield, uh, but you don't have to, depending on the jump gap distance, there's a whole theory on that. Uh, but the provisional, if you can make it, is very important. If you can't make a full provisional, I think it would be a custom healing above it. So this is the kit. You kind of see the different burrs. Uh, it has a very nice uh, little diagram on the bottom showing you how to use each one. So in case you forget, it's very, very helpful. And it goes from left to right in that sequence. So it's very easy to use. Okay, so just to recap real quick. Uh, you start with the broken two. Uh, you use the gates glid in to find the working or use the CBC to find the working length that gates glid in to remove any uh, nerve or gutta percha. Initial shaper one to uh, cut mesia distally so that the depth of it is seven millimeters, not going to go all the way, but it's going to create that little chop to begin with. You're going to finish the cut with the initial shaper two. Okay, and you kind of cut in a sort of a semi lunar shape so that you have more of the shield on the buckle and maybe a little bit interproximal as well. Okay, so that's going to be important, especially if you want to plan for uh, future implants on the adjacent. So that's always a good thing to plan. Uh, when you're removing the palatal portion, you definitely don't want to put an instrument in between the two portions and separate them that way because you do not want to cause any pressure on the buccal root. You're going to put your finger on the buccal mucosa and make sure, or the buccal attached gingiva, and make sure that no movement is occurring there while you're gently taking out the palatal portion. After that's done, series of round burrs to shape uh, and kind of thin out the, the shield until you have kind of the semi-lunar crescent there of a millimeter to two. Uh, again, this um, final shaper one will help you kind of uh, clean up that excess of the shield uh, so that you're flush with the, the bone of the crest or bone crest. Uh, this is just implant protocol. It can be any implant system. Okay, so let me show you a case um, with this kit, or actually a few cases with this kit before we talk about Howie's new kit. So case one, 81 year old male, fracture two one. So this is how he presents. It's, uh, this is, I would say, this is a very ideal candidate for socket shield. It's a longer route that might make it a little tricky. I'll show you what I mean by that. And this actually was my first socket shield case. So definitely lots to improve on for this one. So CBC image, you can see that the buccal plate, if it's there, it's extremely thin. You can see that this tooth is situated right up against the buccal plate. And you can imagine if we're taking this out, even if you're able to preserve the buccal plate, uh, it's gonna be less than a millimeter for sure. So either you graft it or you do extra grafting on the outside to protect the implant, but you're gonna expect a lot of resorption there. So as you can see, we plan this implant towards the palatal position. Okay, we don't have all that much bone. We could have gone a little bit longer, but we don't have all that much bone there. The bone is quite narrow. Just some more cross sections. Okay, so the crown is removed. Oh, first, before we, we uh, do the procedure, you wanna just highlight that, you know, you do have a nice curvature of the gum tissue and we wanna obviously try to preserve that. The crown is removed. You can see the uh, root um, is present. And I've started my cut, as I said, it should have gone a little bit more semi-lunar. Um, but again, this was my first uh, attempt at this. And I definitely made my cut not directly down the path of the uh, canal. So you can see the piece that I ended up removing was quite small. So this is uh, not a huge problem because it came out cleanly, but it just means that there's going to be a lot of the palatal portion left. That's palatal of the canal left inside the side, which I ended up having to drill out. So a bit longer, but at least it did not damage the buckle shield. So here's me thinning out the buckle shield, trying to create that semi-lunar shape. This is us getting it down just below the gum line. As you can see, I missed the tiny spot here. It's always good to take photos of your work so you can come back and critique yourself. So implant kind of initial pin to, to check angulation, check position. Uh, and then this is the final with the implant placed in. So at this point, so what I want you to kind of see here actually is that there's a lot of space between the implant and the shield. We want to make sure for sure that we're not hitting the buckle shield because if you do hit it as you're turning the implant, it can make it become loose. 
So a sticky bone is used uh, to place inside that jump gap. And then uh, we used his tooth, I believe. I forget actually, I think it was his tooth, yeah, to make a temporary crown and to add some composite on the sides. So that's the delivery, that's the, the, the way he leaves. There's no sutures necessary. Um, this, the provisional is sealing the side quite nicely so that bone graft or anything else is not going to, to come out. So that's how he leaves on the day of surgery. Uh, two weeks. Shot. So you can see that the tissue is healing quite nicely. The tissue has a very nice tone to it. The, the pink color suggests that there's no inflammation happening. Um, we tell our patients not to brush in the area. So there's definitely some plaque buildup. Uh, so that's six frontal view. Four weeks, we had him come back quite often because this was my first case. So I saw, <laughs> I saw this patient every, every couple of weeks. So again, not much, not remarkable in any way. So that's good. Then at four months, we can see that this is a very good thing to see. I know four months is early. We want these to be, you know, many years kind of a follow-up, but we can see that the contour has been kept very well. Uh, we took a new x-ray at four months just to compare. So again, a little critique of myself, a little root shield is just right there, but it's not touching the temporary, so that's good. So this is just the sequence of uh, his x-rays from initial day of surgery, four months. Oh, I'm sorry. You can actually kind of see. You can see the um, profile view of it as well, just to see that the tissue is nice, thick, and healthy. OK, that's a comparison in initial and four months. And at six months, he actually did a little bit of the temporary here. So we started to lose that papilla a bit more than I would have liked. But we decided at this point, he was happy with how things looked. We decided to go to the final impression. So this is me helping one of the restorative dentists make the final impression and they had the crown made um, at the clinic. So custom impression technique, uh, if you guys don't know what this is, is I think a very valuable thing to learn for anterior implants, especially if they've been temporized. So you can copy the exact um, emergence so that when you go to the final, you're going to already have that emergence uh, in the final crown that you had built up for the past, you know, many months of healing. So at six months, I wanted to make sure that the contour of the tissue is healthy. Okay, so that's still there. And this is the final crown. I wasn't thrilled with the way this turned out, but um, I think that, you know, the patient was happy enough. And in my first case, I was pretty happy with how even the gum margin stayed, how thick the tissue looks, and especially for the occlusal view. Final crown and that contour still remains. Okay, so the next case is um, a similar case, but this time the tooth is already broken off. So a 69 year old male broken 2-1, again, same tooth. So for him, same thing. When you're when you're dealing with a post like this, I like to cut onto the buckle of it. So because you're kind of shaping the uh, you're shaping the shield in that way already in that semicircle already. Um, but you can certainly cut it onto the lingual, but then you're going to have to cut it off the buckle anyways. So that gets a little bit tricky when you're dealing with posts. Uh, here, as you can see, I was a bit more successful in terms of cutting down the exact path. I think that helped helped guide my burr and uh, gave me feedback to where I was. Um, and so I was able to cut the whole length of the tooth down through the canal. And you can kind of see that there's even some gutta percha left on this piece that we're taking out. So that suggests we were right down the middle and tip shape looks about correct. So that's a good palatal piece to be taking out. So that's what the socket looks like, the palatal wall, nice on there. So we know we can uh, successfully get an implant in. And I took this picture just to show you that we want the shield to be at the bone level, not the tissue level. So we wanna make sure there's no tooth left at the tissue level. Okay, implant is placed. Again, same thing, it's a healing abutment, uh, place some bone material into the jump gap. This jump gap is a bit smaller, um, temporize and deliver the temporary. Again, it's on PRF. So this is day of surgery, how he leaves. 
And at two weeks, pretty unremarkable. There was already a bit of a gingival discrepancy when you first started. And this is at five months, uh, he was again restored by uh, a general dentist that I work with. And that's the final PA there at five months. So very stable, the tissue looks excellent. There's uh, no inflammation, sign of bleeding or anything like that. That's just the before and after. Okay, one more case, um, actually two more cases. This one is um, done with a bit of guided as well. So uh, here I used a Megen system called um, R2Gate. And I'll show you what that looks like. So this is, a, I think a tougher case, right? 25 year old female, she is got a very high smile line. Um, she's had trauma to these two front teeth, you know, when she was 10 years old. The typical story, I think we hear, as surgeons, we hear the story quite a bit. Um, they've been root canal, they've been re root canal, they've been crowned and cored and closed, like everything that you think of. Um, so we know that, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to think about how to design your shield, maybe not just for this tooth, not maybe not just for this implant, but potentially for a future implant, right? So her one one is fractured right now, but the two one, like she's 25, is it going to last her the rest of her life? It's it's quite unlikely. So that's something to keep in mind as we as we do this case. So this is her PA. You can see that radial lucency on the, uh, the one one here, and the fracture as was actually quite deep, and it was towards the palatal aspect. So there it is from the CT view. You can see the arrow pointing to where the fracture is. Just another view of it, cross section. Okay, so this is um, for any of you that are not familiar. This is uh, Megagen's version of guided surgery, and they have actually a very uh, unique way of doing this because they put it on an app uh, on an app on your iPad. So this video on the left is actually taken from the iPad. It's just a screen recording. So when you submit a case, you tell them what you want to plan, and they will send the plan back to you on the iPad, and we can use either your finger or your stylus. Um, to make any changes that you want. So it's kind of like um, an offline or non-synchronous kind of way to communicate. You don't need to get on a Zoom call with somebody from the lab to, to discuss this. So you make your changes, you send it back to them. They either approve it or not. And then they, you know, you can go back and forth until it's approved. So it, I think it's a pretty neat system and it's very handy. You can do this anywhere. So as you can see, you can kind of select the different um, implant size, you can change things, like brightness, contrast, uh, and look at the CT in many different ways. Uh, when you blow it up, you can grab the implant, you can move any component of it. You can move the implant, you can move the provisional, you can move the angle that it comes out of. Uh, you could, you know, rotate it, just kind of go around and make sure that every angle is, is in bone. So here I'm grabbing a ruler just to kind of measure where they have put the implant neck to where the CJ of the adjacent tooth is. And it's at about four, which I think uh, I want it to be a little bit less than that, not as deep, but I realized the fracture is there. So we kind of have to hedge our bed a little bit and, and go in between. So there you can see, I'm just playing with the STL file. You can. Uh, show more or less of both the model or the temporary. Uh, the temporary you can design yourself, or you can tell them to copy, you know, the opposing tooth, which in this case is the two one. So yeah, just a very, uh, very easy to use system, very um, straightforward. Uh, and this is just showing you uh, actually quantification of the density of the CBCT, which is not always available. So that's neat to see if the bone that you're about to drill into is got enough density that you should be confident in placing your implant. Okay. All right, so what we get back from uh, one of these R2 gate centers, so if a lab is certified with them, they'll be able to do these cases with you. You get back um, the guide, which you see on the left, but I've also in this case asked for a prefabricated provisional. So what we can do is actually, we can plan for the implant to be at the exact depth that we want with the right timing. The timing of the implant speaks to the internal hex position so that um, an abutment such as the prefabricated uh, provisional can be actually be inserted predictably so it's not turned half a turn. 
So I'll show you what that looks like in, in the surgery. So this is the day of the procedure. Removal of the crown, she had this gold post in here that was very difficult to remove. That was definitely the hardest part of the procedure. Uh, here you can see the palatal fracture. So that part came off of the crown and you can see how deep that fracture is and also the response of the tissue relative to the buccal side, okay? So as I said, uh, that was quite hard to remove. I basically just tried to drill it out so I can get access into the, uh, the canal beyond it. And that took quite a while. So here, you know, separating, I'm trying to keep as much of this root, especially interproximally as I can. We're pretty much going from mesial to distal. Maybe it could have gone a little bit more here, but here we're almost at the mesial contact point uh, of the adjacent tooth. And then this palatal portion was removed. As you can see, the fracture is pretty evident there, how deep it was. So there's definitely, there was no way to, to save this tooth. And I think I got most of that in, in one piece. This is after thinning of the, of the uh, buck shield, trying to still keep that contour. And now we're below the gums. That's why you don't see it over here. Okay, so the guide is inserted. We obviously with any guide wanna make sure that the guide will see properly, that it's making the windows for the neighboring teeth are fully uh, seen and, and they're seated. So this is the initial drill. You can see just to check angulation and depth and so the position from a, a closer view. This is what I was meaning about the timing of the implant. So Megagen, um, this is a Megagen any ridge implant. It comes with a carrier that has these green and white stripes. You don't see the white ones here, green and clear stripes. And also a little line there, if you can kind of see right matching to where the plastic of the guide is. So you want to turn the implant at the very end with your torque driver until one of the green slots is fully visible, not like half. And this line is at the height. So that indicates you're at the right height or the depth, I guess, of the implant, but also that you have the right timing for the provisional to go on. So that's a picture of the implant in place, a bit of space between it and shield. Again, same, same ritual, uh, healing about the place so that bone can be put in safety. And then the provisional is just adjusted a little bit chair side. Uh, we didn't, didn't love the color of the provisionals. Again, provisionals inserted with the, uh, the PRF membrane. Didn't love the color of it. So we uh, actually added a little bit of composite material there. And this is a case that I worked with worked on with one of my uh, colleagues and partners, Dr. John Yoon. So that's the PA of the day of insertion. This looks like a final crown, but the crown itself is not final. It's just the abutment looks final. This is her at four weeks. We did some, John did some adjustments of the, the composite here, just to make it look a little bit better. This is her eight weeks. Again, very non-remarkable healing. Um, she said that it was sore for a couple of days, but uh, overall didn't have any bleeding or any swelling issues like that. This is her at four months. Um, we waited a little bit longer just because I wasn't exactly sure about the technique yet. So I tend to err on the side of caution for the first few cases, um, but probably could have restored this implant much sooner. But at four months, we take a PA, you can see the, the crown looks a little different after it was adjusted. Um, final impressions taken. As you can see that the tissue is healed quite nicely, given us a nice socket. So again, custom impression technique, super important because you really want to capture this. You don't want to, as soon as you take that temporary out, this tissue will collapse. So even if you're the fastest scanner or impression maker in the world, you're going to lose some of that, um, that anatomy. So you have to copy it into your impression coping. So this is one that Dr. Yoon did, impression coping is seated. You can see the composite is used to copy that emergence. And then the final crown is delivered, a little bit of blenching, which is not abnormal. Again, that contour of the tissue is very, very important. And this is the final crown. You can see the x-ray looks different, but the implant is very stable. Uh, the bone graft above the implant looks like it has healed quite nicely as well. This is her sequence of x-rays from initial to final. As you can see, not much change in, uh, in the bone around the implant. And I think it's deep enough that it's well protected. Two months post insertion. This is, I think, the last pictures I have for her. And just a quick 
side by side comparison of the initial to final. And again, this is very good for now. But I do expect that two one is going to have the same fate at some point down the road. Before and after. Okay, this is the last case I'll show before we talk about how we's kit. So I'll go through this one a little bit quicker. 60 year old nail fracture 2 1. Okay, so the 2 1 is broken. You can see the root in the x ray. Uh, just pointing out, you know, peri apical radial lucency there on the TBCT findings. You can see that there's lots of good bone apical to it, but uh, the buccal plate, uh, even though it's a little bit here, is going to be quite thin. So that's going to be a problem as well. Okay, so the crown is removed and kept for use for the temporary. We're going to start making our shield. Again, we want to try to make sure that we're cutting straight down so we can remove the shield completely in one piece, or the pallet portion, I mean. Then the shield is thinned out. And for this, I also use the same system, R2 gate plan. I did not plan a provisional for him, so, uh, but we did plan the surgical guide. Initial drill, that's a 2.0 drill. Again, same with the timing, even though we didn't do a prefabricated provisional, this is something that uh, it helps you orientate the implant. Again, not touching the shield, have a bit of space. You can put some bone graft in just like that. Um, so we had to use, actually I couldn't use his two, that part of it had broken. So we had to use um, a putty to fabricate uh, a bare side provisional. So not definitely not as good as some of the other ones that I've made. But that's how he leaves. There's no sutures. The PA shows uh, there's some bone graft above the implant and the implant is at the correct depth. This is him at four weeks, pretty unremarkable. Obviously the temporary could be better. And closer view, you can see that bulk of gum tissue is definitely still present. Three months, take a PA just to make sure it still looks the same. Definitely have a little bit of plaque buildup there. Um, but again, the tissues, the architecture looks just as it was before, probably be a little bit better. And then final impression, same thing as working with another dentist. Um, he was able to do this um, as we have worked together before. So that's how the tissue looks on the day of. Oh, I guess I don't have the final picture. Okay. So, um, the next thing we'll talk about is the partial extraction therapy kit. This is Dr. Gluckman's kit. Uh, this is the newer one of the two. Uh, again, I haven't used this, so just kind of take what I say with a grain of salt, but um, I will be looking forward to using it because it does look very similar and more refined, I would say. It's, it's probably the best way to describe it. So a quick little video here. Oh, hold on. Okay, so instead of the video, I'll just show you kind of the steps um, the burrs are a little bit different, but the concept is pretty much the same. So instead of a gate glidden, you're going to start with a burr that you can attach a little stop to. So you measure on the CT the length of your tooth, you attach a stop to it, and uh, you can drill all the way down. So this just does it in one step instead of having to, um, you know, use the gate glidden and then another burr. Then you use a fissure burr to cut mesia distally, and then remove the palate portion until you're left with something like this. Clean up the apical portion with a round burr and start thinning out your shield. So you go from here to here, you're thinning it out. And then now they have this uh, slightly longer rounded ended kind of um, diamond burr that's going to help you shape that, shape that shield a little bit easier than just the round burr. So after you've done that, you can start reducing the height of it again with the round burr, leaving a little sliver uh, right up against the gums. And then this um, cutting diamond burr, uh, Look like it's been refined and has markings on it to tell you how deep you're going. So that's to get it to the crest level. And then this piece is kind of round, kind of a rounded diamond end cutting, and it's just to give you a shape that looks like that. And that shape is important to create extra space for the prosthetic. Um, between the prosthetic and the, the shape, you're going to have more space for the gum tissue to fill in. So that's really important. The rest of it is similar. You're you know, you're doing your, your protocol for implant drilling and placement. Uh, after the implant is placed, you can place some bone material into the jump gap and then your provisional. And as you can see, it's going to eventually heal into gum tissue. And that space there, you see that little kind of curved space, that's important for some bone to fill in that space. So that's really, really important to leave that extra space there. That's the, probably the biggest difference between um, 
Howie's technique and the former kit. So Howie's kit also has been designed to kind of do the other modalities of partial extraction therapy. I won't talk about it as much here because there's quite a bit to cover, but essentially you can use the same kit, pretty much the same method to do three other things, a pontic shield, um, and then root submerging either a vital or a non-vital root. Okay, so for a pontic shield, but you're, when we do use this is if you're, let's say, taking out three anterior teeth, you're placing two implants on the laterals, uh, on you know the two side ones. In the middle one, you're gonna be making a bridge. You can leave that as a shield to keep that um, bulkiness of the gut tissue and bone once the bridge is made. Okay, so similar concept with the drilling, uh, you're basically making a socket shield, except you're not placing an implant. Okay, so you can place bone graft. Um, and what's important for this is that you seal up the top either with a soft tissue graft, so uh, either an FGG to seal, like a socket seal, or you can use the palatal, like a um, pedicle graft from the pal palate, a CTG to close over this. Okay, for vital root submergence, this is if you're just keeping the whole root. So this would come handy if you're, um, if you have like a tooth that doesn't have an endo problem, like an apical problem, and you don't have to worry about removing that apical infection. So in, if you have an apical infection, you have to do the pond shield, which I just showed you. But if you don't, you can do root submergence, either vital or non-vital. So the, the, the root can be root canal or it can be vital. So the procedure is about the same, a little bit simpler. You basically just want to cut off the root and make it a little bit of an indent here. So there's some space for, um, for healing to occur. For non-vital, pretty much the same thing. Okay, a couple of cases uh, that uh, of Dr. Gluckman's here. Um, this is, this is the one on the left is root submergence. As you can see all you're kind of doing is uh, cutting the root down so that it's flat. You can see the two implants next to it. This is the root membrane, which we kind of discussed already in depth. And then this is the pontic shield. As you can see here, we have to place bone graft because you're creating quite a large gap there. You don't want resorption from the, the palatal aspect. Don't know who drew all over my slides, but if you could remove it, that would be nice. Um, okay, vital root submergence. Um, as you can see, uh, this was done here for this central, whereas you place an implant central and there was already one place at the lateral. So if you know you're getting a bridge here, um, having the central as a vital root submergence is, is good. You can also do a pontic shield here, but in this case, the root was vital. There were no apical um, infections. So you could do this. And as you can see, um, how we put a tissue graft, so pedicle tissue graft from the palate as a connected tissue over it just to protect it. And that's how it heals up, looks very good. You can kind of see that shape, right? So not only do you have socket shield over these two implants, but you also have this pontic shield or a root emergence that creates that nice bulk. Non-vital similar thing, so this is the non-vital root, you can cut that off. And then he just skips right to the final here. That's the final after I think one year. So these two are not implants. These are not implants either. These are just, uh, this is a regular bridge from the two to the two, but they've done root, root banking here, let's call it, to keep that tissue nice and thick. Uh, this is just the last case I'm going to show. This is Howie case. Um, this is showcasing his use of his kit. Um, as I said, I haven't used it, so I'm going to show you one of his cases. Uh, so this patient uh, had an implant placed on the one one, okay? And this is, I'm skipping ahead, but this is her four-year post-op of that implant. Now she's having a problem with the two one as well. So that's how the one one was. This is the this is not case in hand, but the previous one. Okay, so he did uh, as well. Did sock shield, bone grafting, dual zone grafting. Okay, so that's the case there, and this is how it turned out. So after this point, this tooth unfortunately got infected. So you can see on the radiograph here, this is the one that's done first, and we're having some resorption here. So now the one one. Oh, sorry, the two one is also compromised. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to maybe keep that in mind as you're doing these in the anterior, because you never know when one of the other teeth in the area will need an implant. And to have a shield on both sides would be very beneficial in keeping especially the papilla, because it helps keep the blood supply to that tip of the, um, the bone between them. So this is the one year post of the first implant. As you can see, the bone graft took very well. You can see where that shield left there. So without that shield, if you just place bone, it might still be there at one year, but I think over time it will slowly get thinner and thinner. Okay, so now this is uh, how we're using the kit for this two one. So you can see this is the input here on the one one. We're doing the two one now with the new kit. So as I said, the first drill, you can actually put a little stopper. So you're gonna measure the distance and you put this little stopper and you just tighten it with this screwdriver. And that's how it looks on your drill. So as you're drilling, it's kind of like a stopper and it's going to stop right at the edge of your tooth there. So once that's finished, you have basically, you have penetrated through the whole canal, you know you're down through the middle of the tooth and you can start doing your mesial distal sectioning. So that's done with spur here, kind of like a fissure burr. You're gonna go and you can see how much he's accentuated this by um, making it so that the mesial and distal have quite a bit of quite a bit of, uh, of that root shield left. Almost to the point where he removes so much palate that the part that came out, you can see the zorb part as well, but the part that came out was quite thin. This is the shaping burst, as I mentioned. There's a round version. There's also this kind of longer uh, rounded and tapered burr. And uh, here we have the final shapers to reduce the shield down to the bone crest level. This is us shaping the, uh, the last little part of the shield and then that round rounded kind of end cutting to show to create that little bevel so that there's extra room for the bone to fill in. Uh, again, he did a mega gen plan here with the guide. And for her was only able to place a custom healing abutment which is definitely better than a regular healing abutment for cases like this. This is her after some healing. You can see that the, again, very predictable, very um, you know, similar to the other side because we have two socket shields next to each other. And then this is her four year post-op, uh, how things look. Okay, the last thing I'll talk about real quick is what are some of the future directions? Some of this is already happening. It's not so futuristic, um, but just some of the ideas about how do we get this technique to be more uh, common, you know, so that when people are doing it, it's more predictable and we can apply it to more, more scenarios. So it doesn't have to be just anterior teeth. Uh, first thing is we definitely need more data. We need more data required. Uh, it's in the form of hopefully prospective studies. So retrospective studies only tell us what's happened in the past, obviously. Uh, prospective studies which show us, you know, how, how predictable this is. Uh, Multi-center studies from either all over a country or all over a world definitely be very beneficial in showing that this can be something that can be done in, in many different places and under different uh, circumstances. Uh, you could possibly do some kind of a guided socket shield. So I'll show you that in the next slide, but um, that along with dynamic navigation like Navident um, are kind of the futuristic aspects of, of implant dentistry in general. So that certainly applies to socket shield as well. And then you can employ this, and a lot of people already are doing this, but to uh, full art therapy. So keeping using root banking, using stock shield to keep all the bone around, because uh, I know once we take all the teeth out, for sure you're going to have lots of resorption. Okay, so just to touch on three of them, guide to PET, uh, maybe the idea is to deliberately design a guide like you're placing the implant through the middle of the tooth. Um, this is not to actually place your implant there. It's for you to have that initial drill to remove that um, part of the tooth and be able to separate the two of them. Just to kind of take a little bit of that human error and that visual error out of it, that you can actually have the first uh, guide or first drill it could be guide. That's an idea. Full arch pet here, as you can see, a combination of socket shield in the back. Okay, rude banking in the front. I think there's sockets on these two implants as well, and that one as well. So then you can see it over time. Not only do the implants have lots of good tissue on the buckle, that one looks really good, but even in between where you've kept the others for root banking, especially this canine over here. So 
that's definitely something that we can, you know, start looking forward to. Uh, how we here even has a five-year follow-up of one. Okay, so this is, uh, we know these cases, a lot of people are doing them, but these cases uh, look very good initially, but they can certainly come with a lot of issues down the road, whether they're mechanical issues or they're biologic issues. And doing something like this might help us keep the gum tissue healthier over time and make it actually more like they just kept their natural teeth. Okay, and so that's it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Sorry about the technical errors. Um, uh, on the screen, you have my email and also my Instagram handle. So if you ever want to get in touch with me, that's how. Um, the special word, so hopefully everyone's paying attention, the special word for getting your CE, as mentioned probably a hundred times today, the word is PET, P-E-T. So put that in the email when you uh, send it to info at megagen.ca to get your, your credits. Okay, so that's all I have for you guys today. We can uh, open the floor to some questions. I got a few questions <laughs> uh, from Dr. Dave Lee, David Lee. Um, gave us some questions. Um, Dr. Lee, for the immediate anterior implants, do you use guided surgery? I know you sent, uh, showed us about Altugate um, case, but can you answer the question, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use a combination, David. Thanks for your question. Uh, as you can see, I do some freehand and some guided. Um, guided systems are good, but uh, I think uh, as a, my advice to an, an, any implantologist is that they need to be as good as the guide with their freehand because uh, you never know if the guide is going to work the way that you designed it. But I think guides are very, very useful. And I, with time as CBCTs, as STL files, they get more accurate. Uh, your guide is gonna be better and easier to use. They can also make guides probably smaller than they used to be because of material. Um, and they're easier to make now. You can print them if you have a 3D printer. So absolutely anteriors, you can use guided. Um, it's, it's personal preference. I have done both, I like both of them, just depends on the case. Thank you, doctor. Um, from Dr. Hiba, um, hello, thank you for the lecture. What is the best protocol in case of a large periapical disease, socket preservation or immediate implant placement or just wait for healing? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it depends on if you're able to clean that infection out. So, you know, studies from a long time ago, I think it was Evian had a study um, that basically said it is safe to do immediate implants in cases where you have a typical radiolucency. My protocol, so most of the anterior teeth that I do implants for uh, either have a radiolucency because they have an endo problem like a fracture or, you know, recurrent endo or they're fractured. So for the endo ones, I would say I, Definitely prescribe an antibiotic ahead of time to start a few days before. Uh, but really, during the surgery, you just have to make sure that you remove that granuloma and clean out the area as much as possible. And then, of course, follow up with an antibiotic afterwards as well. So it's definitely safe to do that. There's no right answer. You can do socket grafting safely. You can do an immediate implant safely. Um, you can also just delay the whole process and it should be okay too. Thank you. I think it was a good answer to Dr. Hiba. Um, there's another question from Dr. David Lee. Um, after you split roots majorly distally, how do you determine that the bulk of root was reduced to, uh, to perfect thickness? It is uh, easy to penetrate through the bulk of wall. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, I'm not gonna lie, that's definitely happened to me. So on a case where I was planning to do socket shield, got the paldo root out and started reducing the buckle root um, I would perforate. Um, and sometimes when you do that, you can fix it. Just imagine if you had a periapical kind of penetration there anyways. Uh, but sometimes if it compromises your shield, that's really when you have to check the integrity of your shield. If it's a little bit mobile at that point, you unfortunately have to take the rest of it out. Um, to avoid it, I would say it does come with experience. This technique is a little technique sensitive. Uh, it is. Um, it does take a little bit while to kind of get used to. And I find especially for the anterior teeth, because a lot of them are tilted in such a way that the root is very buckle, um, you either end up cutting it too paolo or you end up cutting it too buckle. It's, it's kind of hard to gauge that angle. 
Um, but I would say just a lot of it comes with experience. But I think that's where maybe having a guided pet uh, initial drill really helps, right? It helps you go down the canal straight down so you know you're safe or you can do it through uh, navigation. And then once you're down there, it's much safe. You can just reduce a little bit at a time and kind of check uh, to see that you have enough room for your implant on the pallet. Okay, great. Thank you, doctor. Um, there's another question from Dr. Lisa. Uh, what do you use to clean out a large area of granulation tissues? Um, curate or burrs? I mostly use curettes um, because it's a little safer than the burr. It depends on the, the type of granuloma that you have. Um, my assistants will attest to this. They get really excited when we're able to remove the whole granuloma as one. And my tip for that is don't try to scrape the granuloma out um, as you would normally with the, the, the scooping end of the, uh, the, the spoon. What you would actually do is turn to the other end of the spoon and instead of scraping upwards, you actually push against the bony walls downwards to try to detach the walls of the granuloma from all the areas. And then when you scoop it out, it should come out as, as one piece. Um, so I mostly use the spoon. The burr, I will sometimes use if, um, if I feel like the granuloma just came out in, in shreds. You know, So if you're kind of scraping a lot and it comes out in shreds, getting a nice diamond burr just to kind of smooth out the area before you do any grafting or implants is, is a good idea. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, I think that's all the questions I have for now. Okay. okay that's good. So any more questions? I don't see that. Okay, again, thanks for joining the event. Uh, we'll, we'll come back with another amazing offline or online seminar as uh, Dr. Jeff Lee mentioned. Thank you for your time, doctor. I uh, hope you all you uh, stay yeah, healthy you. and I'll uh, see you soon again. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.